بسم اللہ الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ و علی وصحابی اجمائین اما بعد فاؤز باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح علی صدری و یسر علی عمری وحل الختم السانی افقا قولی السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اوکے سو ان شاء اللہ وہ ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ دی پلرز آف اسلام ان ٹرمز آف دا گڈ ڈیڈز دیٹ ایوری مسلم نیڈس ٹو ڈو اینڈ دیز آر دا فائیو بیسک پلرز وچ وی ہیو ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ ان سرٹن لیکچرز بفور بٹ ان شاء اللہ آئی وانٹ ٹو put them together inshallah in one uh, session so that we can understand what the pillars of Islam are uh, categorically. Uh, the first one of these is without a doubt the kalima or the shahada ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolu or to say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasoolullah there are different versions of it but it's all the same meaning that I testify and bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah and that the messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is his last and final messenger. This is a proclamation of faith which is compulsory upon every Muslim who claims to be a Muslim that he has to believe in this and so when every <coughs> any <coughs> new person comes to Islam we ask them to recite the Shahada the beauty of this Shahada is that it is our admission into Islam and so to take admission into Islam is very easy in other faiths it might be difficult they might make you do certain things here and there but the thing is with Islam it's very easy all you have to do is to proclaim this bil lisan through your tongue you proclaim it knowing this in your heart that you believe in it and alhamdulillah welcome to islam you are our brother or our sister in islam alhamdulillah it's easy but to graduate from islam is slightly more difficult to graduate from islam you need to do the all five because admission is easy like for example if you take admission into comsat it's very easy you fill the form and you apply and alhamdulillah you got on merit you pass the test alhamdulillah you're in comsat but you haven't graduated yet. In order to graduate, you have to do your assignments, your quizzes, your tests, your sessionals, the second sessionals, then your finals, then you get to graduate from Comsat. In the same manner, in Islam, admission is very easy. You say, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha illallah, Alhamdulillah, no one can now call you a kafir, you are Alhamdulillah Muslim. But you haven't graduated yet. You will graduate once you follow all the five pillars. And these five pillars, the rest of them are, number two is prayer, as salah Salah is basically, the difference between us and the disbelievers. The Prophet ﷺ said that the difference between us and the non-Muslims is that we pray Salah and they don't. Tarko Salah, that's the main difference. So if you are a Muslim, if you claim to be a Muslim, now you cannot say that you know what, now that I've said the Kalima, Alhamdulillah, I'm fine, I don't need to do anything else. You have to pray, it's far upon you. Like for example, if a person did not take admission into Comsats, they don't have to wake up early in the morning to attend the class at 8.30 in the morning. But once you have taken admission, then you have to attend class. If you don't do that, they'll kick you out. In the same way, if a person is joining a school where they have a, they have a uniform and everything, you cannot say that, you know, uh, as Allah SWT says in the Quran, La ikraf al-deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Yes, there is no compulsion, nobody is forcing you to become Muslim. But once you become a Muslim, then you have to do certain things. Nobody is forcing you to join a school, but once you join a school, you have to wear a certain dress code. You have to come to school on time. You have to leave when the school is over. You cannot stay there till night and set up camp there and everything. You can't do that. So likewise in Islam also, once you say the Shahada, Alhamdulillah, you have entered Islam. Now you have to follow what Muslims are supposed to do. If you don't do that, you become sinful. Sometimes even get kicked out of Islam because of that reason. So number one is Kalima, number two is prayer. So we have to pray. And this is something that we know was told to us by the Prophet ﷺ that the first question you will be asked on Yawm Al-Qiyamah is about Salah. The first question on the Day of Judgment will be about Salah. If that is good, then everything is good. And if that is bad, then everything is bad. So prayer is extremely important. And the prayer means you have to pray five times a day. Not two times, one time, three times, every Jummah, every Eid, no. It has to be five times a day. This is what means uh, to say Aqim as Salah, establish prayer. The third thing is fasting in the month of Ramadan, which is fard upon all of us. Unless, of course, uh, a person is a traveler or is sick, then they can obviously uh, delay that. Again, that also depends if a person is permanently sick or is, is temporarily sick. If they're temporarily sick, then they can make up the fast later on. If they are temporarily traveling, they can make up the fast later on. But if they are permanently sick, meaning they have such a medical condition that prohibits them from fasting. They cannot stop eating food. For example, they have to take medicines every two hours or something like that. Then, of course, they can 
uh, feed the poor in that place. So there is kafara for that, which they can do, and inshallah they will be uh, rewarded for the fasting. So, but the thing is with salah, even if you are a traveler, you have to pray. Even if you are sick, you have to pray. You can't uh, stand up and pray, no problem. Sit down and pray. You can't sit down and pray, no problem. Lie down and pray. So there is no excuse for not praying. You can't do wudu, you can do tayammum. So there is no excuse. So prayer, alhamdulillah, is one of those acts of worship for which there is no excuse. But okay, fasting, yes, there are certain things that you can or cannot do within that time frame. But the fasting is to be done in the month of Ramadan. Any other fasting is what we call nafal fasts. Like, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, fasting the middle three days of the month, fasting for Muharram and things like that. These are things which are nafli ibadat and you can do them for extra virtue and extra reward inshallah. But the fasting that is mentioned here is what is fard, the 30 fast of the month of Ramadan or the 29th fast, uh, fast however that year uh, the month of Ramadan is. The fourth thing here on this list is zakat and zakat comes from the word of tazkiya, same root word, zakka, which basically means to purify and zakat is basically a purification of your wealth. Whatever might have entered your wealth in a slightly haram way or even as if the Prophet ﷺ, as he said, that you know even if there would be a time when uh, even if you don't deal in riba, the drops of riba will be falling upon you or the particles of riba will be falling upon you. So maybe I'm working for, let's suppose, a company and that company is halal. I, I, I mean, the stuff that they're doing is okay, it's like permissible. For example, it's a software house and I'm working for a software house. So the stuff that they're doing is okay, it's, it's all permissible. But I don't know that this company is actually taking riba from some bank and now because of that reason, their wealth or the stuff that's coming into the company has become uh, polluted. And so because my salary is part of that, I'm not directly responsible for that. So although my salary is halal, inshallah, but there are particles of haram in my salary, which I'm not to be blamed for. I'm not blame worthy for that. But it's part of my salary now. My job is halal. What I'm doing is completely halal. It's everything is like uh, within the boundaries of Sharia. But there are certain particles of haram in my wealth. And those particles now have to be cleansed. And so Allah subhanahu wa has made a process of purification of wealth that you have to give say 2.5% every year as part of your excess wealth that you have, you have to give that. And it's dependent upon different property, for example, on sheep, on camel, things like that. It's different, it actually varies. So zakat has to be done every year. So it's a purification of your wealth. And normally people, they wait till Ramadan to give the wealth and that's okay, inshallah. They wait for zak yani to pay zakat, they normally do it in the month of Ramadan because it's the Islamic calendar and you kind of keep track of it that every Ramadan, inshallah, I will dispose of whatever is excess of wealth. Then number five is Hajj, uh, which is another pillar of Islam. And so the building of Islam is based upon these five pillars. You take one pillar down, the building can fall. So all of these five pillars are holding Islam up. Now the Hajj, the pillar of Hajj is basically uh, an act of worship which has to be done once in your lifetime. If you have A, the wealth to do so, and B, you have the health to do so. So your wealth and your health have to allow for you to make Hajj because it's a long journey and obviously it's, uh, it, there is a certain amount of fatigue involved in that. So if your health does not permit you, then of course this is not fard upon you. And if you don't have the wealth to travel, even now you need a certain money to travel to take the ticket to Saudi from here and then go back and all that, plus the expenses while you're there. So once you have that money, but once you have that money available, then you should try your level best to make Hajj as soon as possible. Once you have that much money available, then do not de delay Hajj unnecessarily. In certain countries like Malaysia and so on, uh, they actually uh, make people uh, kind of like an obligation that as soon as a person is married, the government kind of helps them go for Hajj. Very young age, Alhamdulillah. So, uh, inshallah, that's a good practice that uh, as soon as a person gets married, one of the things that they do immediately is that they take their wife for Hajj and Alhamdulillah, uh, they, can, they can start their journey of marriage on the right foot. So these are basically five pillars of Islam which are essential for every Muslim. Now for the students, I would say that Hajj might not be fard upon you right now. Meaning that if you are a student, uh, maybe Hajj is not obligatory upon you because you're not earning for yourself, because uh, uh, you don't have money of your own right now. Once you get a job then you can have that. Zakat might not be obligatory upon you right now. Meaning God forbid, God forbid if you were to die today, uh, Allah will not ask you about Hajj. Allah will not ask you about Zakat because you don't have to pay Zakat right now. Fasting, Ramadan is coming in a few months. <coughs> we'll talk about it then. Uh, so we don't have to worry about fasting right now. 
Um, prayer is something that we will all be questioned on. Regardless of you had wealth, no wealth, whatever, even if you're a poor beggar, then you have to pray as well. So, inshallah, this is something that is obligatory upon us. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, very recently actually, I was going to the masjid in the morning for Fajr prayer and I saw there a man who was at the trash can and he was taking stuff out of the trash can. And I thought, subhanAllah, this person, because when I went into the masjid, I thought he would just pick up something and then he will come join us in the masjid or something, because the trash can is right next to the masjid. Uh, is a big uh, CD a trash can. So I, I thought maybe he's going to just pick something up because he was putting it in, into a sack. I thought he's going to put in and then he's going to come in for prayer. But even when I came out of the masjid, he was still at the trash can. And I was like, Subhanallah, this person missed his Fajr Salah for trash. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a Sahih Hadith, he said that the two rakah you pray before the Fajr Salah are worth more than this dunya and everything it contains. This is talking about the two rakah you pray before Fajr. Yani, this is talking about the sunnah of the Fajr Salah. And the rule is that the farz is always more reward worthy than the sunnah. So if the sunnah you pray is worth more than this world and everything it contains, then the farz is obviously worth a lot more than that. And this person would leave that reward, trillions upon trillions of dollars, he leaves that to spend his time picking up trash. So I made this intention in my heart that I'm going to talk to this brother and tell him that even, you know, I mean forget the trash, I'll give you 100 rupees a day if, if you like, 50 rupees a day. You just pray your salah. But don't waste, it. It, what, how long will it, 5 minutes? You can't give, you can't leave trash for 5 minutes to pray salah. You know, so we have to be, and, and so people do this all the time, people might be sitting at a shop, maybe somebody has a newsstand, he's selling newspapers. Azan goes off, Maghrib salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the guy is sitting there. You, you could get up and pray for five minutes. How, how many millions of dollars have you lost in five minutes? If you just leave your newsstand, if you leave your grocery store, if you leave your business for five minutes, how, how, how many million dollars will you lose in those five minutes? 20 rupees, 50 rupees, 100 rupees. And for that, you are leaving the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, we need to make sure that at least we pray. And then all the other things fall after that. So that's basically the pillars of Islam. Then there is the articles of faith, the six articles of faith, and this is as per, you find this in, in the Quran as well, uh, a mention of these things, also in the Ahadith, Amana Billahi wa Malaikatihi wa Qutubi wa Rasuli wa Yawm Al-Akhir wa Al-Qadr, Khairihi wa Shar, these are the six articles of faith. And this we have also discussed in other sessions, but inshallah I wanted to join these two together so that it's clear that uh, there are the pillars of Islam and there are the articles of faith. The articles of faith are six, number one, belief in Allah, Amana Billahi, Wa malaikatihi, malaika, the angels, uh, and the books and the messengers. So we believe in the messengers and the rasuls, and we believe in the day of judgment and the divine decree or the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Belief in Allah is clear. We've talked about shirk and tawheed and things like that. So a Muslim can never do shirk. That is zulmun azim. It's one of the biggest crimes that a person can commit. And we know from the, from the ayah of, of the Quran that when a person, Allah can forgive any sin, but he will not forgive a person who associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is a direct um, negation of the kalima the one who says la ilaha illallah it is a negation of that if you do shirk likewise in surah al-fatiha we say iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help so if a person is asking for help other than Allah and worshipping other than Allah then this is shirk and this is also a negation of the articles of faith it is a negation of the pillars of Islam the first pillar of Islam so therefore belief in Allah is obviously it goes without saying it is the most important number two is belief in the angels what do we believe about the angels we believe that the angels are many in number much more than the human beings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these angels are made of light and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used them for different jobs for example some of the angels are the carriers of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some are going to drag hell on the day of judgment 70,000 angels with uh, each chain and Jahannam will be dragged by 70,000 chains each chain will be dragged by 70,000 angels so you, so you can do the math how many angels that is then there are angels that are uh, angels of wahi who are bringing revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu there were angels who bring the soul who breathe the soul into the baby when the baby is in the womb of the mother and there are the angels of death who pull the soul out of the body and there are angels who bring down the rain 
and the angels who bring down barakah into your houses tanazzulul malaikatu war ruhu fiha bi izni rabbihim min kulli amrin salamun hiya hatta matla al fajr this is when the angels come on laylatul qadr and so there are angels so many that the prophet once heard a creaking sound and he said that i have heard the creaking uh, you know when you step on something heavy when you step on like uh, if there is a wooden flooring and a heavy person walks on it there is a creaking sound that the floor makes the person said i heard this sound coming from jannah because not even an inch is left on jannah except that there is an angel bowing before allah over there that's how packed jannah is right now with angels so alhamdulillah this is uh, yani the makhluq of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they never disobey allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they're always obedient to allah they don't have free will we as human beings have free will angels don't have free will they do whatever allah says there are angels with each every single one of us according to the most correct opinion four angels with each of us four angels with you all the time all the time all the time one on the left and right these are known as kiram and katibin those who are writing one of them is writing your bad deeds one of them is writing your good deeds so they keep writing every day every day so what's the benefit of believing in angels the benefit is that when you know that you know the security is tight on me then your actions change if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just told you that you know i'm watching you that's it that's good enough for us for some people that might be good enough but if you are told that no no apart from allah watching you there is direct cctv footage with you all the time constantly you're being monitored recorded the, this book is being written so i say that you are the owner of your own books you are the authors of your own book make sure that it's worth reading on the day of judgment you are the authors of your own book make sure it's worth reading on the day of judgment because the one who goes and he's been shown in his book in his in his in his, in his right hand he'll say ha umqrahu kitabiya he'll tell people come on come on read my book because he got the book in his right hand he's successful but the one who gets his book in his left hand is gone so two angels writing what about the other two angels there are the two angels which are in the front and the back of you and abdullah ibn abbas radhiyallahu anhu had this opinion he said that there are two angels who are in the front and back of you also and these are angels that are protecting you and ali ibn abi talib also said about them that if your death is coming uh, then these angels move away they don't protect you that day because they know this is your time of death so they leave you otherwise these angels guard you from different harmful things that might be around you and we don't even know this is the world of the unseen allazina yu'minuna bil ghaib this is the world of the unseen we don't know what's going on but subhanallah you know when you recite your azkar when you go out of your house and you say bismillah tawakkaltu ala allah la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah then there are angel uh, the, the, there are shayateen outside two two of the shayateen they say that today this person is protected and he's in the safety of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so today we cannot hurt him let's go back so they leave you they don't they don't bother you you know at the time of maghrib prayer the shayateen are unleashed there are shayateen everywhere at the time of maghrib after after maghrib maybe half an hour 40 minutes later then they say that you can take your kids out the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that when the time of maghrib comes before maghrib bring your kids inside and then after maghrib is over then inshallah you can go out if you like that's okay but right at that time the shayateen are everywhere so you don't know how many times allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected you uh, from different harms and so if uh, something is coming your way these angels deflect it they get it out of the way but when your time has come it's come and you know for, in order to boost your iman you can go on to youtube and watch like uh, videos that are of near death near death videos a person who almost died and you understand subhanallah how did he get out of that have you seen some of these videos a very uh, subhan ajeeb yani you can go and you can search like for example um, accidents that uh, for example non fatal accidents or for example you can search for uh, near death experiences or things like that and there are many videos like that where they will show you like cctv footage and things like that how there was a car accident and there was an old lady crossing by and the car went over the lady and the lady was saved or a child uh, a car went over the child but nothing happened to the child because somehow one angle one degree here or there the child missed the you know uh, underneath the axle of the car or subhanallah the many many things like that who is protecting these people we because in islam we don't believe in chance islam we don't believe in luck we know everything that happens is because of the qadar of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's number 6 inshallah which we will talk about so therefore it is a decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we believe in allah we believe in the angels we believe in the messengers the nabi and the rasul and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent over 100000 prophets 
and these prophets have come down to all of mankind. Ras Madra says uh, that we have sent upon every nation. وَلَقَدْ بَاسْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ We have sent upon every nation a Rasul who has said what? إِنَيَبَدُ اللَّهُ وَجْتَنِبُ التَّعْهُودِ Worship one God and do not worship false gods. So we know that messengers have come to every nation. No matter where they are. You know, to the Zulus, to the Aborigines, to the Native Americans, to Europe, to Asia. Everywhere they have come. And so they have come with the same message. And so over time some of the people began to worship some of the messengers. Rather than worshipping Allah, they began to worship messengers. But Allah did send messengers to all nations. And this was so that people don't say on the Day of Judgment that we did not know how to follow this. You know, imagine if just the Quran was revealed. Without the Prophet ﷺ, we would have said, this is a good book of theory, but you can't practice this. So the Prophet ﷺ showed us how it's done. So the messengers, they are delivering the message and showing us how it's done. So that on the Day of Judgment, we cannot make excuses. That, you know, the, uh, this book, although very good, is not practical. You cannot follow this. So the Prophet ﷺ showed us, his companions showed us, Alhamdulillah, so we have to follow. Then number fourth pillar of faith is, or article of faith is books. Believing in the books that were, that is the Quran and all those that came before. Of course, we know today that these books have been corrupted. And the only book that is left, that is in its original form, word for word, letter for letter, is the Quran itself. So, other books that have been mentioned in in the Quran is the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, uh, and Suhuf Ibrahim. Allah SWT talks about that also. Suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa in Surah Al-Ala. So, again, these are the books that have come and there could be many, many other books. Some of them might have been corrupted. For example, uh, recently, you know, we find that even in the Hindu scripture, there is, mentioned of, there is mention of the Prophet ﷺ in Bhagavad Gita, Rig Veda and things like that. So, Wallahu Alam, Allah knows best. I'm just saying something. That, you know, Wallahu Alam, Allah knows if these books were also divinely inspired, but then over, over time they changed heavily. Wallahu Alam, Allah knows best and we don't know. Because there is mention in these books of the Prophet ﷺ and it goes back to you know, talking about Medina and that state and so on. So, Allah knows, and even maybe the books of the, of the Buddhist also, perhaps their scriptures have also been uh, corrupted over time and only Allah knows what the uh, actual truth is. Five, uh, on number five we have belief in the day of judgment, uh, which is one of the most uh, strongest things that will make you change your actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَبِلْ آخِرَتِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ And in the hereafter they have yaqeen, which means that if you have yaqeen in the hereafter, really this will change your behavior. Nothing will change your behavior faster than having belief in the day of judgment. Because once you believe that, you know that you will be held accountable. You know that forever, for everything that you do, there is reward and punishment. And if there is reward and punishment, then you change your actions appropriately now whilst you're still alive. So you need to have firm faith that one day I will die. One day I will be put into the grave. One day I will spend my first evening inside the grave where I will be alone in the graveyard. The graveyard itself is a very lonely place. Inside that graveyard, that massive graveyard, my grave will be there and I will spend my first evening in the grave. What will my state be then? And the angels will come down and they will ask me questions. And then that grave can become for me like a garden from the gardens of paradise or it could become a horrible place for me. And then I will be resurrected on the day of judgment and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me accountable on a day that is 50,000 years long which is the day of judgment, I will be held accountable. So these are all the things that once you believe in this then you change your behavior. When you know about the day when the result will come out, you change your behavior accordingly. And the last and final thing is the divine decree of Allah Taala in the Qadr of Allah that whatever happens is by, is by the permission of Allah. Not that Allah is pleased with it. Remember these are two different things. One is the pleasure of Allah, the rida of Allah, that Allah is razi with something. And then there is something that is the, uh, by the izn of Allah Taala or by the permission of Allah Taala. So if a person steals, this is not that Allah is razi with him. Rather, Allah has allowed for this to take place. So the Qadr concept is slightly hard to understand. But it's very important. Because you have to know that everything happens by the permission of Allah. Bad things that happen, Allah is not razi with these people or with that action. But rather Allah allows or permits for them to do that. Because through that action, something else might happen which is very good. Alright, so I'll give you an example to send the point home. Um, 
you know, uh, without being very political or anything, Imran Khan's mother got cancer. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing, right? But Allah allowed for it to happen. By the izan of Allah, it happened. Although Allah Mantra wants ease for you, Allah doesn't want hardships for you. But Allah allowed for this to happen. Now she passed away. But then what happened? Imran Khan started to focus not on cricket. He started to focus on the cancer hospital. And Alhamdulillah, he built one. And many patients were treated through that hospital. And then many other people had ideas to build other cancer hospitals. And so what happened as something bad had amazing consequences. So sometimes things happen in our life which are cl clearly bad. We don't understand the logic behind it. Why did it happen? But if that had not happened, do you think if Imran Khan's mother died uh, in an accident, a car accident or in something else, like not, of natural causes, old age or something, he would have still built a cancer hospital? No. He would not have been, a, I mean he was a cricketer, why, why on earth would he build a cancer hospital? The reason was he saw his mother suffering through something and that started a reaction in, in himself that I need to do something about cancer. And so he spent his life building that hospital. So the thing is sometimes bad things happen in our life and we don't know at that moment. But it is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it happened and so in it is khair. That's why we say that whatever is happening, look at what is the hikmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes you might be asking Allah for something and Allah is not giving it to you. And you're praying tahajjud for this thing, you're waking up in the middle of the night and making salah and asking Allah, Ya Allah, please give me, give me. I'll give you an example. If a child begs his parents that please let me touch the heater and the parents don't allow it. Are the parents doing zulm on the child? No, rather the opposite. The parents are not letting the child touch because the parents love the child. If the parents didn't care, they say, okay, fine, take it. Okay, fine, touch the heater. Allah subhanahu wa knows what you're asking for. And sometimes he knows what you're asking for is doom for yourself. And you don't know that. You know, sometimes uh, a guy might be making dua, Ya Allah, give me the, like, the latest VTI, the Honda Civic VTI. Ya Allah, please give me, give me, give me. And Allah is not giving it to you. And you're begging and you're praying to Hajjad and Qiyamul Layl and you're making zikr and you're praying Quran, and, you know, reciting Quran and making dua after every, every ruku that you recite, you're making dua, dua, dua. So Ya Allah, please, please, please. Allah is not giving you because Allah knows the moment I give you, this car will become your death because in this car you will have an accident and you and your family will die. Allah knows this. In the grand scheme of things, this will happen because Allah, for Allah, nothing is hidden. For us, time is past, present, and future. For Allah, it's all the same. It's all in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what is in the past, what is happening now, and what's in the future. But we don't know. So sometimes we're asking for our own death and we don't realize. Sometimes we might be asking to get married to someone. Allah knows this person is, not, is, is no good for you. He will ruin your dunya and your akhira. You making dua, Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, please. Allah knows you will kill yourself if you do this. So the Prophet said what? He said when you make dua, it never goes uh, astray. It never leaves its target. Because if you make dua, either Allah will listen to you, or Allah will remove a calamity that was coming your way through that dua, that the dua wasn't fulfilled. Ya Allah will, yani either Allah will give you that thing, or because of this dua, Allah will not give you the dua, but he will remove a problem that was coming your way. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you something in place of it on the day of judgment in Jannah. And in another hadith we find that a person who will go to paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him the result of his deeds. He'll say, Ya Allah, this is amazing. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show him another place and show him another gifts that these are all for you also. And he will be like, wow, this is amazing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will ask Allah, Ya Allah, I mean, I, my deeds are finished, how, how come I'm getting all of this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him, this is the result of those du'as that were not accepted of you in the dunya. And at that moment he will wish, I wish none of my prayers were accepted in dunya. If this is what I was going to get, then I wish none of my prayers were accepted in dunya. So inshallah, we understand the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is amazing. Right? Yes, that's true. There is a hadith of the Prophet from Tirmidhi where he said that dua can change destiny. Meaning if you make dua, you know for example, because you, you see destiny again, qadr of Allah, is something that works on two levels. There is one qadr of Allah which is what Allah wrote in Allahul Mahfuz. No one can touch that. That's the complete divine decree of Allah Then qadr comes down every year also. 
द डिक्री ऑफ अल्लाह कम्स ऑन एवरी ईयर एंड इट्स अपग्रेडेड एवरी ईयर सो लोहे महफूज कंटेन्स एवरी थिंग एवरी ईयर अरस पात्र सेज द लाइलतुल कदर लाइलतुल कदर ही खैर मिन अल्फिशार इट इज बेटर देन अ थाउजेंड मंथ्स तनजलुल मलाइकतु व रूह फीहा बि इज्न रब्बिहि मिन कुल्ली अमर सलाम ही आता मतल अल फजर सो दिस इज अ नाइट व्हिच इज बेटर देन अ थाउजेंड मंथ्स एंड इन दिस नाइट तनजलुल मलाइका द एंजल्स कम डाउन विद द अमर ऑफ अल्लाह सुभान तआला सो एवरी ईयर दीस एंजल्स एट द नाइट ऑफ कदर इन द लास्ट 10 डेज ऑफ और 10 नाइट्स ऑफ रमजान दीस एंजल्स कम डाउन ऑन द नाइट ऑफ अल कदर and they bring down your destiny for that year meaning how much risk how much wealth how much life how much death how much sickness how much health all of this thing comes down and so when you make dua you know because of your dua somebody's destiny can change and your destiny can change <clears throat> maybe in your year it was written that this year you will have a slump in business but you made so much dua allah subhanahu wa taala changed that and made you smooth but all of this was written in lahul mahfuz that this person's life was going like this then he made dua and it being like this and then he made dua and he went like this so even in lahul mahfuz this is written when you made dua and when your destiny was changed so that's why we say that make dua for people because we don't know whose destiny is awaiting your your dua for them we don't know whose destiny is waiting for you to make that dua so inshallah make lots of dua and so this can change destiny and alhamdulillah this is all part of the permission that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us and the angels to do certain acts and in these acts even though they might look like something apparently bad has happened inshallah we have full faith in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in it maybe i do not see it what's the good but i will see it and allah will show me because our knowledge is limited our knowledge is not uh, yani complete allah is al alim al hakim his knowledge is complete he knows everything so we cannot possibly have our knowledge is nothing it's not even a speck of dust compared to uh, the knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's nothing yani we find from the sahih hadith that musa alaihi salam and khizr alaihi salam as they went on the boat khizr alaihi salam and musa both are getting knowledge from allah and khizr alaihi salam said to musa alaihi salam that you know that bird you see at the edge of the boat which is dipping its beak into the water how much water is left on the beak musa alaihi salam said nothing because you know beak goes down it's not like something absorbent it absorbs or no nothing it just slips off He said, "The water that's left on the beak of the bird, that is your knowledge and my knowledge combined, and the knowledge of Allah is the ocean that you see here. So surely we cannot compete. So Allah knows exactly. Just like a small example is, as I already told you, that parents know better when the child is a baby. Child might be asking for death. Child must, you know, I mean, might be asking for a sword or a dagger or a pistol to hold in their hand. But the parent doesn't give it to him, knowing that the child will misuse it." hurt himself kill himself maybe so therefore we trust allah subhanahu wa taala and the qadr of allah subhanahu wa taala and whatever happens happens we try our level best from our perspective in terms of however much we can make an effort we do the rest we leave to allah subhanahu wa taala and say inshallah whatever happens alhamdulillah la kulli hal whatever happens we still praise allah subhanahu wa taala for that inshallah so this is uh, the articles of faith may allah subhanahu wa taala enable us to uh, believe in all six of these and to follow the five pillars of islam at the very least and inshallah try to be the best muslims that we possibly can subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik bismillah alhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh this is raja zaul haq and i'm very very happy to join you in this amazing ramadan preparation event Uh, the topic of course being supercharged ramadan, ramadan and, and i'm not going to take too much of your time but i'm going to inshallah try my level best to give you in about uh, 25 minutes inshallah uh, some very very solid points how you can maximize this month of ramadan now before we begin you have to understand that this is such an amazing month that for this particular month the the, the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the salafus salihin they used to make dua 6 months before the coming of ramadan that oh allah give us a life long enough that we can uh, see this month of ramadan because of the absolute blessings that are in this month and after 6 months after the month of ramadan had passed by they would make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh allah whatever actions that we have done in this month please may you accept them so they were praying for acceptance of their uh, deeds done in this month of ramadan because that's how important this particular month is my dear brothers and sisters allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions in the quran iqtarabal linnasi hisabuhum wa hum fi ghaflatin muridun 
the day of judgment or the day of reckoning is upon the people it's very close to them yet the people are heedlessly neglectful and their hearts are occupied with trivial matters and whenever a revelation from Allah comes to them they treat it very lightly the Prophet Sallallahu he raised his fingers like this and he said my coming and the hour are like this that right after my arrival and when I leave this world then after this there is no other Prophet who's going to come over the one lakh prophets who have come they have already come and gone the scriptures that had to come they have already come and gone but now for us the Prophet Sallallahu is the last and final messenger there is no other messenger after him there is no other book coming after him the only thing that is coming now is the day of judgment and so what is going to work for us on the day of judgment is only our good deeds a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he asked the question Ya Rasulullah Mata Sa'a when will the hour be? The Prophet ﷺ gave him a very interesting reply. He said, the hour will come. The hour will come. What have you prepared for it? What is your preparation for the hour? So my dear brothers and sisters, this month of Ramadan is the month of preparation for the hour. Literally, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, this is the month in which the Quran was revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about the virtues of this month. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us about the virtues of this month. You have all heard the hadith where the, the, the Prophet ﷺ said that may his nose be rubbed in the dust. The one to whom the month of Ramadan comes and he is not able to get his sins forgiven in this month. And we know that this is a month in which there is a night. Which is better than a thousand months. Laylatul Qadri Khairun min al Fishar. Tanazzalul Malaika Tubarruho Fiha bi Izni Rabbihim min Kulyam. This is a night. Uh, which is better than, not equal to, better than a thousand months. A thousand months means 82 years and four months. 82 years and four months, for some people, it's a lifetime. So the ibadah that you do in this one night, yani forget the whole of Ramadan, just this one night is special in and of itself. Yani let alone the whole month, but this night in particular is very special. Then we are told from the hadith of the Prophet the one who prays Qiyamul Layl in this month starts with the Imam, ends with the Imam. It is recorded for him as if he spent the whole night in prayer. Again, extra virtue. We are told about yani, that the Prophet ﷺ, how he used to give charity in this month. He would be like a fast wind, so, yani, spending fees as much as he could. And all actions, indeed all good deeds are multiplied in this month like nothing else. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he defines the purpose of this month, he defines it uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah when he says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, kutiba alaykum as siyam kama kutiba alallazina min qablikum lallakum tattakun. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may become people of taqwa. Now what is this taqwa? What is this something that we're striving for? A lot of times when you ask people, you know, why do you fast the month of Ramadan? Some people will say, you know, I fast because uh, we want to feel or experience what the poor people go through. Some people say we fast because it helps to detox our body and cleanse. Okay, these might be side benefits. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning in the Quran is that fasting has been prescribed for you so that you may have something called taqwa inside of you. What is taqwa? It is a type of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which makes you move away from sins. A type of fear which makes you move away from sins. For example, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses several words for fear. Like for example, the word khawf, it, it is actually found in the Quran. For example, shaitan, he said, Inni yakhafullah rabbul alameen. I fear Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And then we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used other words in the Quran like ra'a, a kind of fear that is easy come, easy go. Like you know when you go to your house and you have uh, your younger brother or younger sister hiding behind the door. So as soon as you enter the house, they go, boo. What happens? They startle you. And this type of startling is a, is a, is a type of fear which is called ra'a. Easy come, easy go. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa says, Pulubu yawma is a wajifa. On, on that day, their hearts will be wajifa. A type of fear that when your heart is pounding in your chest and you feel as if it's in your throat. Like when you hear a big news that, you know, for example, uh, tomorrow is your final exam. Again, you're like, what? And the, and the heartbeat seems to be coming from the throat. This is another, uh, another type of fear. Then the word taqa, which basically is the root for taqwa, is a type of fear which makes you change your actions. Like when the Sahaba would be asked about this, they would say it is like walking on a thorny path. How do you walk normally? You just walk normally. And how do you walk on a thorny path? You watch out, you watch your step, you watch your clothes, because you don't want them to get torn or you don't want yourself to get hurt. In the same manner, 
Taqwa is a type of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which makes you leave uh, bad deeds, leave off sins. So how do we get Taqwa in the month of Ramadan? Because in the month of Ramadan, you, despite the hot temperature, despite the fact that we've been busy from 9 o'clock till 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock, and we come home and we are exhausted, we're tired, we're thirsty, we're hungry, and then we come home and we find this nice glass of water sitting in the fridge, very cool water, or we have some food lying on the table. But do we hide behind the fridge or hide behind a door and start eating it? Even if there's nobody in the house, do we eat all that food? No, we don't. And the reason for that is what? Because we know that Allah is watching us. So my dear brothers and sisters, what we are proving in fact to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month is that we have the capacity, we have the istatat to leave off even halal things for the sake of Allah. That this tea or this water or this food is halal, but oh Allah, because you have commanded me not to have it, by Allah I will not have it. And you know that people can, if you leave food and drink for an extended period of time, people can die because of that. So you leave off your basic desires to eat and drink. For whom? For the sake of Allah. Because Allah is watching. So my dear brothers and sisters, if you can leave halal things for the sake of Allah, can you not leave haram things all year round? Because when you do the comparison between how, much, how many things we have halal for us and how many things are haram, really there is no comparison. For example, in food, what has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made impermissible? You can't have uh, lahm al-khinzir, you cannot have like the flesh of swine, you cannot have uh, anything on which the name of other than Allah has been pronounced. You cannot have dead animals like, you know, animals that die in a car accident or of natural causes, you can't have them. Likewise, you can't have blood. But on the other hand, you look at the whole continental menu and the Pakistani menu and the American steakhouse and the burgers and the pizzas, and there's a huge list of food items which you can have, all permissible inshallah. On the other hand, what is haram in terms of drink? Uh, alcohol is haram, you can't have blood. But on the other hand, you have apple juice, orange juice, mango juice, you know, you have tea, coffee, all of that is permissible. So when a person would leave halal options and go for haram, how unfortunate would this person be? So in the month of Ramadan, this is an exercise that, oh Allah, I have the capacity that for your sake, I can even leave off things which are halal and permissible. So what, what about, how easy would it be to leave haram things for your sake, inshallah. Now, this is a month of Ramadan in which uh, we need to you know, control ourselves and the, at the end of it, we need to find out have we changed as a person. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, I know that there are three types of people who go into the month of Ramadan and they come out of the month of Ramadan. The first type of person is the one who goes in and comes out the same way. He isn't any better, he isn't any worse. The second type of person is the one who goes in and comes out even worse. He did not even pray in this month, he refused to fast in this month, he refused to give charity in this month. So he actually comes out worse than he was before. And the third type is the one who goes into the month of Ramadan and actually comes out better. How better? Because he has got more taqwa, he has had a plan, because they say that if you uh, fail to plan, you plan to fail. So what you have to do, my dear brothers and sisters, is that you have to make a plan. And I have to make a plan. We have to make a plan before the month of Ramadan starts. So it's really fantastic that we're having this conference today on a Sunday. Uh, because we can now, we have a few days, inshallah, to plan what we can do in the month of Ramadan. Because don't go in this month without a plan. Have a very clear plan of what you're going to do, inshallah, in this month. How many surahs will you memorize? How many... Uh, uh, yani, or duas will you memorize? In which masjid are you praying taraweeh? Uh, and so on and so forth. Just have a whole list that these are the things that I have to do. How much charity do I have to give? Where do I have to give the charity? Have a plan of action. If you are, if you have the opportunity to give dawah, if you can have a halakha in your own house, even if it's with your family members, just four or five people, no problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your efforts, he does not look at the outcome. He is looking at what effort you are putting in for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is up to Allah to multiply that effort many many folds. So inshallah have a plan of action. Now uh, the way to uh, control yourself and to be steadfast is to master your nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, about mastering the nafs that on the, on the day of judgment, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى The one who feared standing before Allah and controlled his nafs from vain desires, for him is paradise. So how do you control your nafs? Because in the month of Ramadan, the shayateen we know are chained up. The shayateen are chained up in this month. So the only thing that you have to battle with 
is your nafs. Throughout the year, you have two enemies. Your nafs, nafs ammara, and then you have shaitan also. So he is whispering something, something is happening from inside, and so you end up doing wrong action. But in the month of Ramadan, shaitan are chained up. But yet still sometimes people do wrong because they have uh, habitually had a, a bad habit which they keep on doing over a period of time. So this is why they end up doing wrong action. So how do you control your nafs? Controlling your nafs is like, you know, uh, the, the whole story about cowboys and Indians. How the cowboys would tame uh, wild horses and mustangs and so on. How does a cowboy tame a wild horse? You see that the cowboy would look at a, uh, for example, wild horse or a mustang and he would ride it, ride a wild horse. And what would happen as soon as he would get on top of the animal, the animal would start to jump and buck and weave and try to throw the rider off. This would be the ultimate objective of the horse that I need to throw the rider off. And the ultimate objective of the rider is that I don't have to get off. I have to keep holding on because if I let him go, if I let go of the horse, what's going to happen? He will fall down, he will give up and then he will never be able to control that horse. And that horse will remain wild and uh, not at all tame or under the control of that rider. But if, if the rider decides that I'm going to hang on, I know it's difficult, I know it's difficult, I'm going to hang on until the horse becomes tired. So what happens after that? Then the rider has the horse under his control. When the rider says go left, now the horse goes left. When the rider says go right, the horse goes right. So now the horse is under this beautiful animal, this beautiful creature is under the control of the rider. Your nafs is a lot like that. The first time you try to tame your nafs, it will buck and weave and jump and try to get rid of you. But then you do it again and again and again and again until you are now in control of your nafs and your nafs does not control you. For example, the first time you wake up for Fajr Salah, is it easy? No, it's not. It's very difficult. You wake up and your nafs is saying, go to sleep, go to sleep. It's okay. Relax. It's okay. You still have time. It's okay. And so the person, if he goes to sleep, it means one point for the nafs, zero points for you. On the other hand, if you wake up, if you jump out of bed, go straight to the washroom, splash some water on your face, make wudu and, and stand on the masala to start praying your sunnah prayer. Inshallah, what happens? The nafs has been defeated. So one point for you and zero points for the nafs. This is how you have to battle. Likewise, you can look at any other example. For example, the first time a sister decides to put on the hijab. What happens? The nafs says, no, don't do it. This cloth is so heavy on you. Do not put it on. It's hot outside and all of those excuses. What will people say? People will say, oh my God, ye masi ban gayi hai, isko ye ho gaya. They will say weird things about you and you might be hurt because of those things. So why are you putting yourself uh, into all of this trouble? Take the path of least resistance. Take the path, yani, actually they say go with the flow. Just go with the flow. Don't take the path which is difficult. But what happens? You wear the hijab the first day. You wear the hijab the second day. You wear it the third day. What happens? By the fourth day, alhamdulillah, you will feel uh, upset or you will feel awkward leaving the house without hijab. This is how you control it. And so for my brothers also, if it's difficult for you to pray in the masjid, this is the month to start doing that inshallah. So you start doing it the first time, the second time and inshallah make a habit out of it. You beat the nafs until it becomes your habit. And then inshallah it will be uh, uh, easier for you to control your nafs rather than any other time. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if there is something that you've wanted to do uh, in or, or start or begin to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you haven't had the opportunity to, to do it so far I tell you Ramadan is the month to do it Ramadan is the month to do it because all year round you're battling with two enemies but this month you're only battling with one so if you can start if, you, if there is ever a time in the whole year to start something righteous this is the time to do it so inshallah uh, make a plan that I want to uh, get rid of this bad habit or I want to do this virtuous deed and I want to start it inshallah from this month. If you can, if you can plan it, I, I, can, I can assure you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate you because whoever walks towards Allah, Allah runs towards him. So inshallah make that effort in this month. Now as we uh, conclude, I'd like to give you just some uh, practical tips of how to uh, maximize this particular month. Uh, as I said before, have a game plan, have a plan of action of uh, what you need to do and what you don't need to do in this month. So for example, you give yourself the idea that uh, I want to uh, read the Quran in this month at least, let's say, two times. Or you can give yourself the target, those of you who can, that I want to read the Quran in this month 
four times. Every week I will finish the Quran. So you can give yourself a target. I will read, for example, one juz a day or two juz a day or, or something like this. So in this month I will read Quran as much as possible. Or you can give yourself the target that inshallah uh, I will be praying Tarawi in this masjid. So pick up the masjid now. Don't wait till the month starts. That is the first of Ramadan or the second of Ramadan and you're thinking, you know, which masjid should I go to? I don't know where to go. Where is a nice kari? Do the research now. Find out where the nicest kari is, where you can have the most tranquility and khushu in your salah and then go to that masjid inshallah. Don't look for Mullah Ferrari. Don't look for the fastest tarawi in town. You know, I know some uh, Sheikh Saab who, who actually prays 45 minutes. He's done with either 8 rakah or, or, or 20 rakah. Subhanallah, 45 minutes. What kind of salah is prayed 20 rakah in 45 minutes? Subhanallah. And, and and this is by the way a true story I've seen this happen someone who did it I think in about 45 to 50 minutes 20 raka plus with her done subhanallah at what speed wallahu alam just you just don't want to go there so find the best masajid for yourself to pray tarawih and when it comes to giving charity you know the, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the one who feeds the fasting person in this month uh, he will get the same reward for the one who is fasting as well yani the fasting person gets the reward and you also get the same reward for that person so here is another tip inshallah ta'ala the tip is that contact your local masjid and do a deal with them that i want to give you a packet of samosa or a packet of uh, dates or i want to give you a packet of jalebi or something every day inshallah which will not cost you maybe 50 60 80 rupees per day so take some money out of your pocket money to give every day inshallah and even get your family to pull in if they can give fruits or bananas or oranges or something like this make a plan with the masjid and inshallah give it before uh, the maghrib salah so that there are the 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 people who are in the masjid who will break their fast in the masjid and my dear brothers you should be with them in the masjid inshallah you should break your fast in the masjid rather than breaking it at home break your fast in the masjid have some kujur have some water have some fruit and then pray your maghrib salah they, because they give a break of about 10 to 15 minutes uh, do your iftar in the masjid along with the people and you brought some of the food as well so you, so because you made everyone open their iftar inshallah you get credit for that what an amazing way to earn good deeds so inshallah open your uh, uh, iftar in the masjid once you've prayed your maghrib, go back, have your full meal, biryani, shiryani, whatever you want to have, inshallah, no problem. But, but please try and, uh, your level best uh, to open your iftar in the masjid and inshallah feed other people because you get the uh, benefit uh, from them as well, inshallah. Also, something uh, in the end, what not to do. Brothers and sisters, yes, it is good that you, we should, you should wear a new dress or nice clothes on each day. But it would be ridiculous to spend the last 10 nights uh, of the month of Ramadan in shopping malls and at the tailor uh, tailor's uh, uh, shop or something like this uh, these last 10 nights are exceptionally uh, important for us are exceedingly important for us because in these last 10 nights is Laylatul Qadr the uh, the night which is better than a thousand months so I would recommend that you know is uh, you should try to maximize all 10 nights because oftentimes we find people will uh, do ibadah on the 27th and then on the 29th they are relaxing and they are going to the shopping malls and all don't do that it's the 21st 23rd 25th 27th 29th all of them are important as a matter of fact i would say utilize all 10 nights inshallah because sometimes we get the dates wrong here and there so what you might think is the 20th might actually be the 21st or what you might think is the 21st might actually be the 22nd so inshallah to be safe it's only 10 nights in the whole year maximize your effort uh, in this time inshallah do not be uh, spending the month of Ramadan and these precious hours shopping in malls because the marketplaces are the worst places in the in the sight of Allah and the masajid are the most beloved places to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also do not use this time to experiment with buffet iftars here and there because that's not the uh, essence of this month yes if you go once or twice fair enough but the whole idea is not that the whole month of ramadan is spent uh, experimenting with different buffet options 800 rupees all you can eat and so on because if you do all you can eat then it is very very probable that you will not be praying taraweeh prayer so inshallah uh, be wise also do not use this time to uh, in the in the day hours or the night hours to be excessively playing video games or watching movies and seasons and this and that because this is a waste of your time and it is also very unproductive and it's a waste of the precious hours uh, of this month also we find that people are having uh, volleyball night tournaments cricket night tournaments uh, football tournaments you know from the whole year you found the month of Ramadan 
to have your tournaments. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Please do it some other time of the year, not in this special and sacred and blessed month. So use every minute, every second, every hour of this month for productive ibadah, inshallah, so that it may be recorded in your good deeds. Also, this month is not about uh, sleeping all day and eating all night. Try to avoid these habits. Try to uh, utilize your hours as best you can. So inshallah, bottom line, the month is fast approaching. You have to have a game plan. Make the game plan now. And inshallah, put it up on your wall if you have to. There are plenty of Ramadan planners out there online as well. You can have a look at uh, some of the websites. I think IOU has one um, out there about how to plan your Ramadan. Get hold of one of those planners. Put it up on the wall. Tick mark what you're doing. Keep progress. In the end, I conclude with what Umar ibn Khattab would say. He would say, do your muhasiba. Yani take account of yourself before hisab is done on you or before your accountability is taken on you. Inshallah, uh, I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive us for our sins in this month. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the righteous deeds that we do in this month. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us, not according to the quality of our deeds, but according to his own majesty. Inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.